we are looking at the history, the unfolding history of the Jewish people. And here's where I think we, we need to have some common sense here. For example, this comment that was put on my post talked about, in fact, let me read it to you. I say, well, why am I giving this person any, any acknowledgement? Because I want to show you how sometimes we can get like a, a record that's stuck, it's broken. I know that doesn't for young people, they're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> okay, I know. Um, you know, I, I have stated that when they came back from Persia, it was no longer Judah, it was called Judea. And there's a reason why this is important. This person basically discounts and says it's really not that important. Here, I think too much importance is placed on the fact that Judah was a province of Persia and then later under Greek and Roman rule. Now, why? why is that a problem for you? Because that's the reality. And if you don't think, as I will show you, if you don't think that each time they were exposed to other people, that it had an impact on them, all you have to do is look at this country Okay? And look at the immigration that happened at the turn of the century with Irish and Italians predominantly flooding New York City. It changed the makeup of just New York City. So you can't say, oh, well, it wouldn't. These people coming into a land and essentially taking it over, there's going to be some cultural impact. There's going to be some linguistic impact. So don't think this person, for example, is under the impression that they say here, so while there were certain freedoms they did not enjoy, you cannot say it was not a true nation of Jews and Hebrews simply because they hadn't answered to a foreign power. No, you're missing the point. They had not, I will show you today, probably for the first time in this series, scripturally, why that is a mistake. I will show you. And then... If this person says, becoming a convert does not mean you are now part of the geneolo genealogical tree. You know, that's a story for another day. I'm not going to answer that. But what I am saying to you is, actually, I'm going to show you today how we identify a turning point that is crystal clear, not ambiguous, especially for Hebrew, that is ambiguous. So we've been studying the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and we find that those that returned from the Babylonian captivity back to Jerusalem were disorganized and a disjointed commonwealth that had not only been tasked with rebuilding the spiritual center, the temple and its walls, but there was another rebuilding that had to occur and that is the spiritual soul of the people that returned. You see, the Levites had scattered all this is in this book. I'm not making any of this up. It's not my opinion. It's from the Bible, and I'm kind of giving you the paraphrase so we don't have to spend an hour just reading Scripture. So the Levites had scattered into other parts of the country, and they left for one particular and one singular reason. The Levites lived and depended on tithes, and they depended on certain, we'll call it the leftover or allotted portions of food. Remember, the Levites never got land, so they couldn't grow. They, weren't, they didn't have you know, agriculture, per se, as the other tribes did. So when all the people leave the spiritual center, the Levites left too. They had to go somewhere else to basically to survive. So now we have something else that happens. Nehemiah issued a proclamation that anyone that deserted needed to return and take up permanent residence in the capital. And I covered this last week. There were too few people, 42, 43,000 people, too few to populate everything. So Nehemiah says, stay close to the city center. We'll repopulate it that way. And people who were living in rural parts, a tenth of them are called to move to the, to the center of the city. That way they could start rebuilding the community. There are three families consisting of 642 people who could not prove. Now, this one here becomes important. 
Nehemiah, if you'll turn there, please. This one is very, very important because it'll substantiate everything that I've been saying now. You know, laying a foundation, sometimes we don't get to look at Scripture immediately. Today we're going to look at some and you're going to see what I'm saying. So if you turn to Nehemiah 7 and verse 61. And these were they which went up also from Tel Mela, Tel Haresha, Sherub, Adon, Imer. But they could not show their father's house nor their seed whether they were of Israel. Oh, wow. That's, if, if you didn't get that right away, I'm going to just tell you to look at something in a second here. 642 people. Take a look at I wrote it out from the Hebrew. But not they could to show Beit, family, this word here you'd know, Aleph and Beit, Av, so the fathers of them. Not they could show family, the fathers of them, and descendant, basically you see Zeruah, the seed, whether from Israel they were. Why is this a huge problem? Because for the first time I'm showing you something, Nehemiah wouldn't let them wouldn't admit them into the community for the priesthood. Why? Because they could not prove their father's family. Now, did I not talk to you about this modern-day concept of matrilineal descent? Right in this book right here, Nehemiah would not admit them because they couldn't do two things. They couldn't show their father's house. Doesn't say mother's house couldn't show their father's house. They couldn't prove. And something else. This adds something into the woodpile, albeit confusing. It says here, whether they were of Israel. I want you to, we're talking about the southern kingdom, Judah, and Israel was referred to as all, the United Kingdom or the northern part. So for the first time, we're seeing a change in how we should understand something. But again, I, I digress to something. To show their lineage, father's house and seed, not mother. So while all of these people who'd like to be critical of me and not look for themselves, there is no place in this book that says the mother must be of a certain or the father must be. God was against mixed marriages for a reason, to preserve the seed, but he also knew that in, and there's abundant references here in this book that these mostly foreign women, not so much foreign men, but foreign women would usually turn away their husbands from serving the living God. That is book after book repeated. Number two, when we, when we start looking between Ezra and Nehemiah, we find some things that really just need to be paid close attention to. Ezra assembles the people together, he says, as one man in an open place, which is before the water gate in Jerusalem. From that time forward, from that gathering, we have the Sabbath obeyed. See, here's where things begin to crystallize. If anyone failed to comply or violated the Sabbath, they would be exiled. So when you start rereading Ezra and Nehemiah, I want you to look at something. There's actually an attempt to separate people out, and it's happening here. And that will, this is the, we'll call it the germination of what we now call Judaism. The Sabbath must be, must be celebrated, must be kept up. But here's the problem, and this is, this is what you have to look for. At this time, Ezra and Nehemiah, they do not know what labor is. Thou shalt do no servile labor. Thou shalt basically rest for the Sabbath. But they did not know what that meant. They were as ignorant about this, universally ignorant. They were pressing grapes. They were loading their beasts of burdens and taking their fruits and vegetables and their animals to the marketplace and merchants from Tyre who had fresh seafood would come in and buy and sell. 
spices, you name it. It was bought and sell, sold on the Sabbath. So now Nehemiah has to define that there shall be no work whatsoever. And in order to make sure that this is carried out to the T, he says, okay, we're going to lock the city gates. No merchants are coming in. Nobody is coming in to do business because it is the Sabbath. So a, we'll call it a redefining of what it is, is now the people can't say they didn't know. They now know. No buying, no selling, and no foreign merchants. No one's allowed in to do anything in the city center where they would have. So the Sabbath being stri strictly kept is something we see here. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. Didn't God give the Sabbath back there in Exodus and say, and thou shalt keep the Sabbath? Yeah, he did. But did they keep it? Well, all you got to do is go back there and read, and pretty much we're pretty clear to know that there was probably a lot of Sabbath violation even back then. So the first thing we know, if you're looking to modern Judaism, for example, and you say, well, what, are they, what separates them out? Well, the Sabbath does. Friday sundown begins the Sabbath, Saturday day until Saturday eve sundown, and that is your Sabbath period. So it, although it was celebrated earlier, now it becomes this is how we are doing it. And unlike in the days of Moses and throughout the whole book, you'll notice something very, really radical about what happens when Ezra and Nehemiah speak to the people. They don't just say, yes, Yes, we, they, they are full of religious zeal. Absolutely, this is what we're going to do. It breaks our heart that we didn't do this while we were in captivity. So to the person who thinks that they were celebrants of Judaism in captivity, they may have had some trace things that they did, but even we read of how the language was even suffering because people were born in Babylon, the language even suffered. And I'll show you plenty of references to this. So now what we see, you know, in the New Testament, we read of something. Jesus tore down the wall of partition, right? We're seeing the wall of partition go up here. This is where it starts, not, not anywhere before. This is where the wall of partition starts. If you read Ezra and Nehemiah carefully, you are going to see Judeans who will keep the law, and the rest of its inhabitants, so much as if they are not adhering to the law, they must go. They must get out. So we have almost like a separatist mindset that is taking, getting traction here. And the other thing that's interesting is it's at this time where people living in Judea, we, we're having a transition from the place that you live, I am a Judean, I live in Judah, to now the religious practices are beginning to take over and start coming to the surface more as people identified less with the land they live in and more with their practices. And this only happened after they came back from exile. It's equally safe to say that Nehemiah saw what I would deem as the first formation of heresies or sects even in his day. And I said sex, that is S-E-C-T, in case somebody's hard of hearing. All right. Uh, developing within, these, within this community. See, we tend to kind of say Judah or Judea and not think that there are, are little pockets. So, yes, they live towards the city center. But something else we tend to not think about is there were scattered people throughout Judea. Remember, that's why they called a 10% of them to come to the city center. So there were people practicing different things. Now, this is all starting to take shape here. The Torah is viewed as wisdom. Remember, the Torah, when it was given to the people, the only person who seemed to be quite giddy about the Torah would have been Moses and the priesthood. And I think the rest of the people probably were like, oh, God, uh, right? Here, for the first time, the Torah is viewed as wisdom, alive, and a, during the period of Ezra and Nehemiah, a supreme court would be formed to interpret the laws and how they should be understood and applied. This all is now shaping up to a performed and practiced religion. A 70-member council is formed in this period with the high priest being its leader and a complete 
religious revolution is now underway. Schools for young men where the law is taught and love for its teaching uh, are treasured, begin to pop up everywhere, not just in one singular place, but they start popping up. And teachers who are called soferim, wise ones or scribes, are charged with explaining the Torah to make the laws applicable to the individual as well as the entire community. So not only is that happening at this time, but something else. New laws that are not part of this writing. New laws are being written, <laughs> this is interesting, to keep people from violating the law. Okay? So now you've got scribes and religious minds and priests who are now writing new sets of laws to help you to not break the law. All right. For example, in Nehemiah's day, the Sabbath began to be kept, but no one knew the definition of labor as I just shared with you. This age gave way to an extremely rigid, strict, stringent keeping of every minute detail that eventually becomes known as legalism, all right? But it's during this period. First Passover instituted after the return from Babylon was actually kept as a very sacred celebration. And now you start to see things like, where did this come from? So for example, Part of the celebration in Ezra and Nehemiah's day of the Passover would be four glasses of wine. Now, guess what? Every drunk would love to go to the Passover, right? <laughs> but, you know, four glasses of wine, that would, you'd have to have wine. And even, even the bums found where to get wine as Passover, right? And this too shall pass. So... <laughs> It's kind of interesting. You start seeing things being implemented that are nowhere to be found in this book. Just like I showed you with Catholicism and with Protestantism, things become added because it sounds good. Now, on the Paschal Eve, whole groups of people now are gathering together to partake of the roasted lamb. If you remember, it's supposed to be household by household. Now they're, they're figuring out how to make this more social. All right. So there are changes being made, but the changes that are being implemented are not being implemented to a people who are begrudging all this. They're actually very giddy about all this. They're happy. They have a structure, and they want this structure. The principal prayer that would become part of worship called the tefillah, which has six short parts of thanksgiving, would be standardized during this time. And the enforcement of law became so strict that any unclean person could not offer offerings, could not receive the consecrated food, or even approach the sanctuary. Now, even back in the good old days, Moses' time, let's say to the time of Solomon's temple, there were exceptions for unclean people. No exceptions anymore. So it's, it's as if we can see the transition is happening. The basic fundamentals of worship of the God of Israel, now embedded in daily life and culture, will get put to the test when Artaxerxes sanctions the worship of the goddess Aphrodite. It's kind of interesting stuff, or I guess they either called it Aphrodite or Mylita. There's actually a couple of different names in Babylon, Susa, Ecbatana, as well as Damascus and Bactria. So an attempt to have the Judeans worship and venerate this idol of love, the people refuse. Now, that's, you might not think that's any big deal, but coming from a people who have a long history of idol worship, something is changing. It might be something in the wine, but something's changing. So during this period, there are pockets of persecution, periods of, we'll call it relative quiet, and then pockets of persecution again. The persecution was rampant in the Persian period, and we, we see the persecution of the Persian court is, and we'll call it the whatever it is against the Judeans, which now are going to be called, begin to be called Jews. One woman named Esther, who we'll, we'll have to look at her book eventually, she seems to have assuaged the 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 anger or whatever it was, the hatred, at least for a time. From the time of, we'll call it Nehemiah's instituting a lot of things, reforms are implemented, and for about the space of 
200 years from the time they come back to about 200 years, we see people very dedicated to worshiping the one true living God, uh, an attempt to adhere and keep the law. And when the Persian Empire is just on its last days, the prophetic book of Daniel talks about the winged leopard, who is none other than Alexander the Great. In fact, in, in Daniel's book, you have the foretelling of all of the kingdoms that will overtake the land of Israel and its people. It's all foretold there, and it came to pass. Daniel is writing the book. In the time that he writes, we have successive kingdoms, if you will, that will be dominating and then fading away. So Alexander the Great would deliver two final death blows when he conquered Asia Minor, Syria, and Phoenicia yielded to the Macedonian conqueror, and after seven months, siege Tyre and then Gaza, these all by 332 BC. Now what's interesting about this period and Judea, pretty, there's some pretty cool stories, but the one that I want to talk to you about is this. Alexander the Great did not impose his religion on these people. In fact, he thought, his mantra was it was very wise to, remember, he conquered the then known world. We're talking about the largest swath, if you look at a map, of so much territory. So it wasn't in his interest to take away people's culture, religion, and language. It was in his best interest to have people kind of status quo, remain with what they were doing and say, it's okay, keep doing what you're doing, except for one thing the language. The language would definitely be something that would be affected. So what we know, this period of Alexander the Great, by the way, is shrouded in a lot of mystery. And why, why I say shrouded in mystery is because we get the history of Alexander the Great at a much later time in history, decades, if not centuries later. So we don't really have crystal clear understanding. But what we do know, there are a couple of stories left to us. Now, here's where the problem begins with Alexander the Great. In Egypt, for example, he honored Ammon, and he desired to rebuild the Babylonian temple to Bel that had been destroyed by Artaxerxes. Now, here's the problem. We don't, I don't have the answer to this question. There are Judeans serving in his army now, whether they were there of their own volition, voluntarily, or whether they were mandated to, I don't know. But they said, we'll do anything, but we won't rebuild a heathen temple. So you're really starting to see changes, because if this would have happened 50 years ago or 100 years ago, they would, they would have probably said, yeah, we'll help, and we want to come there and worship too. Now they're saying, uh-uh, we will not put our hand to rebuild any foreign temple by any means. So there, there is change happening. The, these people who refused to rebuild this temple received chastisement from their superiors. But when Alexander the Great heard about this, he actually was understanding and he pardoned them. Now, after Alexander the Great, so much, everybody's got so much hope, right? And I told you, the real thing that's going to make an imprint is the language. This will be, this period will give way to the 72 scholars who produce the Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. And the legacy, we'll call it, that is left in the wake of Alexander the Great's death in 332 is the fact that linguistically, the people will actually start to use Greek, which for us is infinitely better because of its precision and less ambiguous than Hebrew. So, it be, it, so we're clear, Alexander the Great dies. He makes no plans, he tells no one, no one knows who will succeed him. And that was usually the part of a conqueror. His son or next of kin would take the place, but there was no such thing. So his four generals begin to bitterly fight over territory. And you can divide it into two parts, the Ptolemies and the Seleucid, which will rule the whole swath territory. Ptolemies will be in Egypt, Seleucids will end up in Jerusalem, but I got a long ways to go. So we have the territories split up. Ptolemy Soter will, as I said, rule Egypt. In 320, Ptolemy Soter demanded 
the surrender of Jerusalem. That's not going to go over well to your other buddy over there who's supposed to be in charge of this land. He wants it, he wants it now. And he realizes the people are not going to give up that quickly. So what he does, he goes on a Sabbath. There's not going to be anybody doing anything because you're not supposed to work, right? And he takes over the city on a Sabbath, like taking candy from a child. And he knew that. This kind of, I think it's kind of funny. They, they didn't even think to protect themselves. He just walked right in and took the city. He was able to see, seize it, and he took many captives to Egypt. So just in this, a little bit after this period, you see people are free, but they're not free. When it was Persia, they were still under the governorship of Persia, and then it'll be the governorship of the Greeks or the Hellenists, if you want to call them that, and after that, it'll be Rome. So even when they come back, please do not make this mistake of thinking, well, they came back and they had free will and they did as they want. They had a very free life, but they were still under foreign rule. And that, I have not changed a quarter turn on that, so it's important to get this clear in our minds. In Judea, the high priest was the person responsible for the collection of taxes. So the high priest now is taking on a slightly different role, which will become the norm from this point forward. He will collect taxes. He'll also wear a political hat as a liaison, as well as his sacerdotal priestly duties, right? So now the priesthood, the high priest, his duties are expanding, and they're actually spilling into a more secular role. That becomes important because that will start morphing Judaism as we know it. That's a big contributing factor. Now, before I get too far into what I'm doing here, I would like to show you why I, my opening statements when I said it angers me when people are silly and say silly things. So I want to show you, if you, I, I think I showed you some of the confusion in translation. Now let me show you where it really gets fun. So I want you to take a look at something here. Strong's 3061. If you look that up, and if you have a Bible like mine, you've got a concordance at the back. So 3061, Yehud. And I want you to see, for those of you who don't read Hebrew, Yehu, the dot in the middle of the Vav makes it a U and the Yehud, right? Yehud. Proper name, definition, the southern kingdom, name of one of the 12 tribes, corresponding Aramaic to Yehuda. The examples I gave here, there are only seven occurrences of that. 3062, and this becomes a challenge, and I want to, want to show you what the challenge is. Remember, Hebrew works on three consonants, the tri-consonant root of Hebrew. So those of you who did Hebrew with me know, and you heard it already, imagine you're going to have three letters with no vowels. That's the root right there, the trilateral root. And then vowels are added at the bottom. So if you look carefully, what you're going to see in each of these words, we've got this word 3061, Yehud, right? The next word 3062, Yehudahi, da, uh, a sound, and he at the end here, proper name, inhabitant of Judah, 10 occurrences, for example. 3063, Yehuda. So you can see all the roots are going to have Yod, Chet, Vav, and Dalid, but the ending may differ. If you remember, that's what happens in Hebrew. The vowels and the endings will change. So here we have definition, probably praised, a son of Jacob Israel, also his offspring, the southern kingdom, also four Israelites, the name of four Israelites who are called Judah. Judah occurs 850 times, Judas, with the apostrophe, two times, and then it says in the Strong's from 3034. So this root, Yahud, take out the Vav, and there's your root, Yada. If you've been here any amount of time, you would have probably heard the late Gene Scott teach on, and don't confuse, there are two Hebrew words. One is Yada, almost an A emphasis, and this is Yad, actually, at its root, Yad. So... Remember when Judah is born, it says, your brother shall praise you, right? It can mean loud praise, confession, confession of sin, confession of thanksgiving. There's a whole 
long definition. And in the Hebrew, I won't get into this too much because I don't want to lose you all, but the, the construction, hifil, kal, piel, whatever, changes the word. So the most important thing is to understand that as you go through the word at its, we'll call it at its origin, Judah, the proper name as it's given by Leah and Jacob means praise or loud. But as you go forward, that meaning will change. It will either have come to, to connote a person's name, land, territory, an inhabitant of the territory. But if you look carefully, the word, and I have to show you because otherwise this probably won't make sense. So let's look up in the Strong's. You know, I, I kind of feel bad because a lot of times I mention the Strong's and I don't take the time for our new listeners to say what that means. They're probably like, what is that? Because I just happen to assume sometimes that people have been following along. No. So this is what you would get if you were trying to look up words in the King James and the King James only. If you have an NIV, don't buy this book. It won't work for you. Okay? I think that's clear enough. So take a look at this. Good Lord, the Lord needs to give me uh, some good eyes right now because this is darn small. If you can see that right there, it says Jew and also Jewess, Jewish, and Jew. So the number right there is, looks like Strong's 3064. And you only want to go to the Old Testament references. You could see this is all Esther, one in Jeremiah, and one in Zechariah. Those are the references there. Okay, if I turn the page, there should be another, another section. My eyes will survive this. Let's see. Yep, right there. So you can see Jewish. That's in the New Testament. That's all New Testament. But here, so these references here are very interesting. Where it says Jews, those are incorrect translations. Some of them are. For example, I showed you that 2 Kings 16.6 should be the men of Judah or the Judahites. It should not read Jew. In fact, both references in the Strong's that say uh, 2 Kings 16.6 and 25.25 should not read that. They should be, it should read Judahite or the men of Judah or the people of Judah, but it should not read Jews. And I'll tell you, there is a distinction. But if you really want to get messed up here, 2 Kings, I think it might be 26. It's very small. Yep, it's 26. Apologies, folks. So, in your King James, the passage reads like this. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna, and Joah, and Rabshakeh, speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it, and talk not with us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. Now, if you want to get confused, take a look at, this is the interlinear. Can you read what they put in English? Can you read that word? Hebrew. Is anybody in here in the sound of my voice? I know there's got to be someone here who still has kept up their Hebrew and can read Hebrew. Can you, Valerie? Yes, Come over here. Can you see what that says? It's really small and you're wearing glasses. <laughs> Yehuda. Yehuda. Yehuda he. Or, or no. That, it's, that, exactly. It's D. Date. Exactly. Yeah, that does not say Hebrew ibiri, right? Thank, thank you. So what they did, if you want a new layer of confusion, they knew instinctively, whoever translated this, that there is no Jewish tongue. So they translated underneath the word for Yehudit, which is the female or feminine word which we would translate either Judith or to signify the language, they knew instinctively to put Hebrew because they spoke Hebrew. They did not speak Jewish. Do you understand now when I say to you there's so much mishmash here, and it's not just one time. Don't think it happens just one time. They did it again in Second Chronicles. This looks like 32 in 18, they did the same exact thing. If you look at it, it's got the same word here for a, a Yehudi cognate, and right underneath it they put Hebrew. And even in the English, they put 
Hebrew. So this is why I'm saying to you, you can't, unless you are going to really dig, don't prognosticate with me. Because I'm the person who opens up a Strong's concordance and finds the mistakes in the concordance. That doesn't mean I'm infallible. It means I'm constantly looking and picking and peeling. So when somebody says, well, OK, well, <laughs> go, go make your squawking noises somewhere else, OK, for the birds. OK, the Greek language will have the impact of the Septuagint. That translation of the Old Testament into Greek will not only reshape the Hebrew mindset, but if you remember, the city of Alexandria with its great fantastic library, which supposedly before it got destroyed housed every imaginable book in the world, but the bulk of the material, no matter what book it was, would have been translated into Greek. So this was a little bit more than just conquering. The language stayed and had a heavy impact on the land. Now in 312 BC, so now Alexander the Great is dead, all right, and the generals are struggling. The Battle of Gaza was fought, and Seleucus, kind of his rise to power starts at this time. There's going to be this back and forth between these powers, and it will be very destructive. It will be destructive to the land. They will once again destroy the walls of the city and portions of the temple again, if that wasn't enough. So we start seeing some strange things that are coming to the surface. In Judea, we have Judea becomes part of the Ptolemaean kingdom, but the Jews or Judeans vow they will be faithful to their God. Now, something else will happen a little bit later. Ptolemy Philadelphus, which is 285 to 247, in that period is what is, we call that the window of the Septuagint. And as I said, that will change everything. Another person that will change everything is a man named Simon the Just. He would be basically the prototype of rabbis to come. So everything that happened before kind of will fade to the distance. And this Simon the Just is the prototype for what rabbis will be in the future. After his death, the office of high priest becomes a slightly more, we'll call it, it's an office that no longer is limited to the high priestly functions. He's become almost like mayor, someone who's got a lot more outreach and say on what should happen is a little bit scary. So on the backdrop of this, you've got wars between Ptolemies and Seleucids going on in Syria. And the land was occupied by one or the other at times, so either the Seleucids or the Ptolemies. Either one was occupying the land. But in 198, we have another throw, more destruction. Again, in 175, the same thing. So it, the last of the Seleucids, which I think is Antiochus, but don't quote me on that, the fourth, that period will begin to show all the fractures of something coming apart at the seams. And just on its heels, you've got a small window before the Romans arrive. So it's kind of interesting. There were things going on within Jerusalem that the people did not care for. So one of the big things that the Greek invaders who were now residents there were very known for as building gymnasiums, right? That is attributed to them. What's also attributed to them is working out naked. And, and the local people were not having it. They thought it was an abomination. They couldn't stand it. And th so now again, we start having these separations of things. And the local people who are steeped now in the customs and traditions, we're talking about maybe the space of 150 years, almost 200 years has passed. These people have now been steeped in the law. And they're looking at these people now as they're not just Greeks, but they might be barbarians. They're not civilized. It's a different culture, different mindset. We have, at that period, a very brutal attack that happens on the people. There's a massive slaughter that happens around this time. The, the site of David's famous city, 
will now become the place of a famous fortress called Accra. So at this point, we have a lot of historians that are writing, including Jewish writers. Now the term is being full-fledged used. And even in the writings that predate, say, the first century, writers, Jewish writers, are still calling Jewish people an obscure, insignificant people as far as numbers are concerned, okay? So when people begin to think of they came back and there's 42 or 43,000, but what you don't consider is in the period from the time they came back to the fall of Jerusalem, how many people, how many waves of persecution and how many people were slaughtered, whole cloth tells you they were greatly, vastly reduced as a number in terms of people. The scrolls of the law that had been cherished, by the way, during this latter period, we're talking, we're now in like the 170s, 180s, these scrolls that were so cherished, if they were found, they would have been destroyed. Anyone who was caught reading a scroll would be put to death, or anyone who was keeping the Sabbath. That was a telltale sign. So really early on, you have waves of persecution that are not even, there's not too much written about them. You start reading and you start seeing, especially when you get into the intertestamental books, specifically the books of Maccabees, Throughout those readings, you can find a lot of information that helps to put clarity on what exactly the people were up against. So while Greek soldiers would perform licentious acts with temple prostitutes, the local people would look on in horror, mortified, but they couldn't do anything. But again, the change that had happened they were no longer looking and saying, yeah, we should add that into our repertoire like, like what came before. Now they're just very dogmatic. We don't do this. We celebrate this. We don't do that. We have all of these rules now being checked off, and the people are adhering to it. Now, that's not going to excuse the fact that during the period that is Ezra and Nehemiah, we had the back and forth with mixed wives, put away the, the intermarriages. No, they took them again. Then they went back. Then they took them again. But at some point, there was a severance. And that period begins the separating of Jew and Gentile. Just whole cloth, there is this separation. So if somebody says, well, when did Judaism start? When is it full? Well, the first thing that you can do is you can open up a Strong's, and you can find the first reference, for example, to Jews, Jewish, or Judaism starts in the book of Esther. And I've said that before. I think a lot of people, when I say that, they just, well, how, how could that be? You, Mentioned two other references in Kings that shouldn't be there. There's a plethora of references that are strictly linguistic. In other words, they say of the Jews' language, it should not be translated that way because we know they spoke Hebrew. So many of those that are suggesting the Jews' language, they did not speak Jewish. They spoke Hebrew. Again, a conflation of terms, which is very annoying to me. So now we're down, let's just call it, somewhere between 200 BC and we'll call it the birth of Christ. In that window, which is a very big window, we have the house of Hasmon and a man named Mathathias who would begin a movement rebelling against false gods. And this man, along with his five sons, would keep throwing down these false gods and these false idols. And after destroying a pagan altar, they fled for the hills. This band of men would become known as Hasidism or Hasidic, but not in the meaning we have now. That meaning for Hasidic or Hasidism today describes a sect of Judaism, religious adherence, but then it simply meant the pious ones. And they were basically another separatist group, if you want to call it. So we talked about the Pharisees. The Pharisees basically are called separatists, but these people are pious and they are separated out from the rest of the group. But don't think them pious like this, because trust me, they, they wielded swords, machetes, whatever they could to defend themselves. So don't think uh, uh, pious, but not too pious to defend and protect their lives or the lives of others. So if you haven't heard of this period called the Hasmonean period, which produces a revolt, which at the first was not even considered a menacing force. In fact, the 
local governments and rulers kind of laughed at it all and said, ha, ha, that's an uprising, uh, three straggling or four straggling Judeans that are threatening us, that don't take them seriously, which was enough time for them to do a little bit of real serious damage. But then the authorities realize, uh, these people are serious and we need to take them serious. Five brothers who led the initial rebellion would all be killed in battle, but Mathathias on his deathbed advised his third son be chosen as a leader. His name just happens to be Judah the Maccabee. Judah, call him the hammer. And that will give way into, if you're interested in reading about that, if you have a Septuagint. In the Septuagint, it usually has the Greek and the English. You can find the book of Maccabees, which is several, actually several books. Or you can probably see it online. There's probably full translated versions online just simply of the book of Maccabees. But it will fill in the details. This son, Judah, would go on to defeat Antiochus' army with consummate ease. And then Antiochus is made to look foolish. But the response, he sets out to exterminate the Judean population. Judah had gathered around 7,000 fighting men. They would be outmanned at least five to one, an impossible victory, impossible. There's no way a polished army versus a band of stragglers, but somehow. And they met once more at the gates of Jerusalem with the city kind of in shambles, but they actually drove the men of Antiochus out of the city. That was kind of remarkable and miraculous. A rededication of the second temple in Jerusalem is commemorated by the lighting of candles, candles called Hanukkah, usually celebrated the 25th of Kislev, which is 25, December 25th. The celebration lasts for eight days, and according to the Talmud, when Judas Maccabees entered the temple, he only found a small jar of oil, possibly maybe enough for one day, but miraculously it burned for eight. Here again, as I mentioned, certain things that will define Judaism. Hanukkah does that. This is a purely Jewish holiday celebration, the miracle that there was enough oil. The same is true of Purim. And now if you start seeing, as Purim is associated with the book of Esther, you start seeing that there are more customs and traditions and people wanting to adhere to them, perform them, celebrate them. The set days and people who do not want to be exiled, they'll actually now fight and lay down their life, which they didn't do, they wouldn't do in the day of Moses, in the day of Joshua, in the day of Judges, in the day of even the kings that ruled. They would not. They had to be forced into an army. Now people would give their life to defend their beliefs, their worship in God, and their new found fledgling faith that is crystallizing before our eyes. Now look, Again, this requires people to be mature. If you want to just believe that everybody back in the woodpile, everybody's Jewish, knock yourself out. It doesn't change a thing for me except that you're delusional. So back to the lighting of candles that would be one candle each night confirmed by the first century scholars Hillel and Shammai. This period will also, as I said, give way to other celebrations within Judaism. And what we see after these books is something really incredible. You'll encounter it in the intertestamental period. It is a national spirit that arises. People are willing to fight and protect and defend, which was never happening before. Having had many victories, the confidence of this group of people under Judah the Maccabee seemed unstoppable. That would all come to an end with his band of 800 men falling in battle to invaders at Elasa north of Beth Horon, with just a few surviving, they fled into Jordan. The struggle to maintain and keep Jerusalem would keep going. And by the time you get to a man named John Hyrcanus, who is the son, he would be the old high priest's son, this period marks the end of political freedom. That when I say political freedom, they had governorship, but there was still room to move. Now this period will mark the end of that. And so when John Hyrcanus died in 104 BC, another power struggle arises and the offspring would vie for this. And then we come into what we call the Hasmonean period, which will take many turns as well. The important thing of what I'm trying to point out today, which I think if you're following along, is we see in this period, in a simple reading, if you'll take the time to, if you have the time to read Ezra and Nehemiah, and carefully stop. Don't just blow through it. 
because we're so familiar sometimes, we don't see things. But when it talks about the enforcement of the Sabbath or exile, when it talks about all the things that the people said now, no longer as an automaton voice saying, yes, we will do this, but yes, we'll do this. And a whole different approach to God and God's word comes out of this period. So what we see emerging is nothing that was being done. They weren't in Babylon saying, you must celebrate the Sabbath. Were there some people maybe trying to? Absolutely. But those would have been a very limited group, perhaps the Levites, perhaps some priests, maybe. That's about it, the average person. Just think about this. The average person, even if they still loved the Lord God, they actually found better things to do in Babylon. And you could say, well, I don't like the way you just said that, but there's enough evidence to show that they weren't really craving God or trying to learn God's word or preserve a language, except for the singers. If it wasn't for the singers and some of the mothers, the tongue would have also been lost. The Hebrew language would have been gone. So we're seeing Judaism crystallized in this period. The worship practices are being crystallized in this period. And the biggest thing that I can tell you, because I'm not done, we've still got more to look at, and the New Testament has so much information that will take everything that I've said until now and crystallize it crystal clear, that something really remarkable. You can see how God did not give up on these people. The ones that were devoted, yes, they, they went through a lot of periods of persecution. There was a lot of people that were killed, martyred, absolutely. But you can see God kind of still was staying by the fact that some of these were so dedicated and devout that I'd say God still, even though when we talk about the land, when they came, from the time they came back until the fall of Jerusalem, they never controlled the land. Yes, they had freedoms, but the land was not theirs as an autonomous people with, they make the rights, they make the rules, they make the laws. No, 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 no. This was done by governors of different countries that came in who were the oppressors, even if they weren't that oppressive. So there are certain things to look at. And in this discussion of who has the land and who owns the land and who wants the land, there are some really good arguments being made on, I'm not talking, please hear me out, I'm not talking about terrorism. And I'm not talking about people killing people for land or to build a port or for monetary reasons. But if you're gonna be honest, this period shows you that when they came back, now, how did they get carried away in bondage again? God, and God took them away for one singular reason. He took the south away to see if having a 70-year timeout in Babylon would bring them back with a clean slate so they could actually start over, which is what happened, for the most part, with that small little band that came back. But it tells me something, again, I'm going to repeat this about God, which is if God's mind and his heart is set towards something, then God may turn his back for a little while. He may go off and do something over there, but he'll be back. And all you've got to do is read what Paul says. And Paul's very crystal clear about this when he says, it's my heart's desire, I have such a heavy heart for my brethren, who, in a nutshell, he says, I want them to be saved too. And goes on, as I told you, Romans 9, 10, and 11, tell you really crystal clear, just read that alone, and it makes it abundantly clear. God is not finished, and the last chapter which I'll keep repeating until everybody hears me, the last chapter of this will be when we have the complete united kingdom back put together again, which is prophesied by Ezekiel and other prophets, which we must look at to show that God has a plan. And it may not be exactly the plan that people like to say, the plan of Israel in 1948, well, that was God's doing. No, that was the doing of people. But it actually worked out favorably. So all we have to do is continue on this course to see as we study, to see and analyze from both the errors, the mistranslations, to better understanding that everything that came before. You know what it tells me? We serve a really patient God. We serve an amazing God. So listen, I said this last week, but I'll say it again. If God could be so patient, oh yes, he had enough at one point. We know he strewed the bones of the first generation in the wilderness. The second generation had their own, and I think up until the third or fourth generation, which is typically how God does things. But even there, 
He never abandoned the people. He may have, as I've said, turned his back for a time, but that's only to gather what we would call the time of the Gentiles, to gather the people so that all can hear when every person on the planet, in God's, in God's way, not in man's way, when every person on the planet has heard, I believe that will be like the, the final chapter, that's it, that's, these are the last days, if you want to call it that. But that's what makes room for God to then turn back to our Jewish brothers and sisters. And Zechariah makes it abundantly clear when he says, they'll look upon him whom they've mourned, they'll look upon whom they've pierced and they'll mourn, as to say, they will know. Right now, they refuse to believe that Jesus is Messiah. But they will know when he comes back. It won't, it won't be, a, there's a little confusion here. You know, why did Jesus have to, by the way, we talk about him being glorified, but when he comes back, I really believe Jesus will still be wearing the body recognizable to the people on earth. And by that I mean, I don't think he'll come back and there, there'll be perfect, no, no nail piercings. I, I really believe that that will be the mark, the mark that shows that this is him, this is not some spectacle. But before that can happen, all these people, all of them, will be deceived between the false prophet and the antichrist. They're gonna think that whatever's being said there is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And they'll be, we must follow this one. And many of them will be completely deceived by the deceiver himself. But that's a story for another day. All we have to be concerned about right now is I'm showing you God's grace to a people. So if God can be that gracious to those people, imagine what his grace is to us who trust him, who love him, who look to him as the author and finisher of our faith. To be continued, that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.